Imagine living your life after 50 and feeling energized and excited about your future. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast, the podcast for women who are ready to figure out what they want and create the life they deserve. Here's your host and master certified life coach, Susie Rosenstein. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast, Women in the Middle. I'm your host, Susie Rosenstein, your master certified coach and midlife mentor. And once again, I'm so glad to be here with you for this week's episode, which is all about the importance of learning how to network in midlife with Nefeteria Fonde. Nefeteria is a certified business and sales coach and the president of Go Get It, Inc. She's also an author and speaker specializing in helping new parallelpreneurs. Have you heard of that one before? Parallelpreneurs are professionals who are building a service-based business while they are working. Neff helps them get clear on who they serve and how they serve them and get confident in their sales skills so that they can get cash into their business. Neff believes that you deserve to have a business with a bountiful bank account that doesn't require long hours, sleepless nights, and countless sacrifices. She's the author of the book, How to Activate Your Faith, Commit to a Plan, and Take Action That Will Change Your Life. It's for faith-based individuals who are interested in learning how to experience the best that life has to offer. Neff is also a speaker who has high energy. You're going to love her. Her energy is contagious, and she provides valuable content and keeps audiences engaged. The thing is that women in the middle have put everyone else's needs before their own, and when they decide to put themselves first, that doesn't just mean self-care. It also means speaking up about why you should get the promotion or why someone should work with you compared to somebody else. These are all really important skills that also show up in networking. Neff teaches others the importance of networking as a key strategy because the method is simple and has worked time and time again over the years to grow people's businesses. She says, She doesn't care how many new tricks come to the marketplace. This one works. It doesn't require anything extra. It just takes practice. And you have been networking since you were able to talk. (laughs) It's really just relationship building. So are you squirming yet? Is networking a concept that completely turns you off and just has you full of discomfort? (laughs) Don't worry, you're not alone. But it's a really important thing to get your head around. So. Don't miss this interview. You're going to love it. Enjoy. Hi, Neff. Welcome to the Women in the Middle podcast. Hi, Susie. How are you doing today? Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you're here. So Neff and I met about three years ago in a marketing and sales community online, and I've been so interested in her approach to selling and helping her clients uh, that I've been, you know, stalking her online and watching what she's up to. (laughs) So a couple of weeks ago, I watched one of her Facebook Lives where she was talking about Neff Nuggets and networking, and I knew I had to have her on the podcast. So before we dive into why I think this is such an important topic for women in the middle, Neff, would you mind sharing with us just a little bit about your background and how you found yourself in this current career? We love talking about how women our age make changes. What happened? Absolutely. Absolutely. So like everyone else, I went to, graduated from high school. I chose to go into military after high school. But after that, I went and got a college degree and eventually got what I would call my grown-up job, right? So I was working for the United States Postal System. I was a clerk, which means I was a person who either sold you the stamps or sorted the mail in the back so the carrier could take it to you. Um, Before I left the post office, I was the secretary for the postmaster of Durham. And I had just decided that... I had did all the adult responsible things. I had checked all the boxes. I went to school. I served my country. I got a grown-up career with good benefits. But I still always wanted my own business because some of the things that I did in between was I got my uh, certification to be a nail tech. So I went to school to do that. And then I also eventually got my certification to be a life coach. And that's what started my career path as far as a coach. And I did a lot of pivoting. So I want your listeners to know it's totally okay that for you to change, decide that's not what you want to do anymore, to make a different decision other than what you have been told how your life is supposed to end. 
get the good job with good benefits and retire, go watch pension or whatever. You can make your own retirement plan by starting your own business or switching to a career that you truly would love that will satisfy you ultimately. That's it. Exactly. There's so much fear when, when you do check the boxes and things start to look pretty good. It's like, oh yeah, everything looks pretty good here. And oh, I'm getting older, getting closer to retirement. I don't think I need to change a thing, but you're unhappy. Wah, wah, you know, that's what happens. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Who wants to live the rest of this life unhappy? Well, what did you know about being an entrepreneur that, that kind of piqued your interest and curiosity? Why did you think that that was where you wanted to go? Well, I grew up in an entrepreneurial household. So both of my parents served in the, the military. And then at some point, my mom made the decision that she would run the family businesses. And she, I seen her make a lot of transitions. So I seen her be an officer in the Air Force. And then I seen her be a planner at American Airlines. And then I seen her do a t-shirt business and I seen her do various business, mm. etching businesses. So I grew up seeing someone making different life choices and pivoting and living life on their own terms, as I would say it, because she had all the education, she had all the experience, she is smart as a whip, yet she chose to build something for herself. And once she built that to the capacity, she decided, well, I want to build something else and I want to build something else. So currently we own a restaurant, a laundromat and real estate. So I've seen it growing up and experienced that it was okay to not check the boxes. It was okay not to be in one career or one occupation for a duration and you can do it successfully and it's okay. So growing up seeing that, I knew that's what I wanted, that I knew I wanted to control my own time. I had always been in jobs where depending on who that person was, they told me if I could go to the funeral or not based mm -hmm. on what I had, what time I had to be there or what time I had to get off determined when I woke up and when I went to bed, they told me when to eat. They told me what was my ideal vacation time. So being, being an entrepreneur for me, being able to control my own time, live life on my terms, and also be able to leave something for those who come behind me is very important to me. Oh my God, Neff, you're just having, just the way you're explaining that, I'm really starting to understand even a little bit more about what happened to me in the five years I was so stuck. Like somewhere along the line, I got the message that longevity in one career was the gold standard. And so when I started to connect to this idea about being an entrepreneur, it actually felt indulgent to me because I had such a good job and the boxes were checked and everything looked so good on paper. So even allowing myself to think about, well, I did kind of always want to be an entrepreneur, even just allowing that thought felt so uncomfortable. So I, your situation with your mom being a role model like that and continuing to start new things, that, that was quite an education for you just watching that. Right. Absolutely. Very interesting. And I didn't know that about you. So... <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit more about one area of expertise that you were talking about on that Facebook Live that day. Uh, one thing I hear time and time again from my clients is how uncomfortable they are becoming more visible in midlife. And as you know, stepping into this new identity can be really important at this stage of life. Sometimes it's because of leaving a job or getting laid off or for whatever reason you're leaving downsizing to a new community and home, sometimes in another town, just a change because of, you know, starting to think about retirement, pre-retirement, empty nest, that kind of stuff, becoming an empty nester, going through a divorce, or even becoming an entrepreneur. So networking is a super important skill. And midlife is a time of life where many of us haven't been meeting a lot of new people lately for a variety of reasons, we need to. So what do you think is really going on here with resistance and discomfort with becoming more, more visible? It comes up all the time. I think because we just have a tendency as women to put everything and everyone before us. So to step in the forefront and say, this is who I am, this is what I have to offer to the world is new territory and often can be very, very scary, right? Because 
we put the kids first or the spouse first or the job first or taking care of the parents first. Everything comes first. We self-sacrifice all the time. And so when it's time to shine, we're like, no, we shy away from it because it's uncomfortable. And so for me, we have to make a decision. And sometimes we have to do the things off of decisions, not necessarily willpower or any extra motivation. We have to just make the decision. This is my time. This is my time to shine. I'm going to stand in the light and what come what may. Well, you wouldn't think it would be a problem to shine, but I also hear this, that it sounds, uh, I don't know, like showing off or, I don't, what do you think is the real problem? Is, is it fear of rejection? Is it just being uncomfortable putting yourself first? Is it actually just being unfamiliar with social skills of meeting new people? What's going on? I think it could be a combination of all of it just because we have had a tendency to utilize our position. I'm the wife of such and such or I'm the mother of this child. You know, that kind of thing that we never had to just stand on our own and say, I am Nefertiri Fonde and this is who I, who I am. In addition to, I'm the spouse of this and I'm the aunt of them, right? So it's always, it's tagged onto something. And I think because it's tagged onto something a lot of the times, or when you go into social spaces, it's who is your kid? You know, what's your kid's number? Or so who, who what does your husband do? It's all those things where they're asking your name, but beyond that, it's, who are you affiliated with here that makes us not comfortable? And then when there has been the individual that stands in there, they're probably shunned or talked about in a negative light and you've seen it, witnessed it or been a part of it. So you're like, I don't want to be that person. So I think it's a combination of all of those things that make people not want to stand in the light and shine. Hmm, That's interesting. I guess the other thing that was coming up for me too is that you have to be more intentional about being in different spaces than you were before because when you had kids, you kind of knew where you had to be. You had to be soccer. You had to be at some school play or dropping a kid off or something like that. And then with work, when you're building your career, you also kind of know what you're supposed to be doing. But then when we're older and there's this identity shift for all kinds of reasons, we have to be more intentional about meeting new people. And the other thing I find is that so many of us have really been ignoring the power of building a network for a long time because we've also been relying on the ease of those other situations. And I've just seen it so often that all of a sudden, like if you're looking for a new job or you're, you're looking for referrals or you are an, a new entrepreneur, you need to be talking to people and you've got nobody to talk to because <laughs> you're, right. you're responsible for your own network now. Uh-oh. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and what I share with the parallelpreneurs that I work with, which are professionals who are building a service-based business while working is when you do go to functions that you haven't been assigned to go to do the work that you lead with what it is that you're doing, building for yourself. So you can start getting comfortable in networking spaces saying, I'm such and such, and this is what I have to offer to the world and start putting yourself out there slowly. And then also being intentional with the networking, you have to ensure you know what is your point for networking. Why are you attending that particular event? Why are you volunteering? Is there someone there you need to meet? You want to meet? Is it something you want to get to know more about that particular space? Because when you're intentional about it, then you have a goal and you have a plan and you're not just checking the box. Once again, that's that whole box checking thing. You're not just checking the box and saying, oh, they say I need a network to get a new career or they say I need a network to get more clients. So I went to a networking event and it didn't work. Well, you got to be more intentional about it. You got to be clear and confident in what it is that you have to offer to the world. And you also need to know who are the best referral partners for you. Don't go to a networking event and collect every business card under the sun and just ends up in a box and be a dust collector or just to clean off the crumbs of your desk, be intentional. Know what it is that you do and know that these are the people I need to connect with. And the biggest, in addition to that, you need to maintain the relationship. Well, let's talk, let's talk, let's talk about that because I think the obvious thing that comes up to mind when people say I have to network is they realize that they need to lean into something, either it's a virtual type of thing 
or it's actually getting off your butt and getting in the car and driving someplace and going to an event. So you're saying be intentional about that. Think of what your goal is. Don't just think, okay, I'm just going to talk to some people and that's it. So when you finish that event, what do you do next? How do you develop these relationships? So for me, I'm very systematic. So there's a, I have a whole, personally just have a whole process. So my goal when I meet people that I intended to meet, when I go to a networking event within 24 or 48 hours, I'm reaching out. Whether it's a phone call, it's an email, reaching out saying, hey, I met you at this other event. I would love to learn more about you personally as well as your business. Do you have, a, do you have time on your schedule? Fill in the date, fill in the blank. For the most part, I haven't had any qualms about people saying, yeah, sure, I would love to learn more about you as well. Then you have a conversation with them and then you start to develop that relationship, right? So that's the whole point. Don't just learn about their business, learn about them personally. So then maybe in a month later or sometime in the following quarter or whatever, you can say, hey, and then also if you're stalking people like Susie, <laughs> and you see that <laughs> they've been on vacation or they got a new grandbaby or whatever, the next time you reach out and say, hey, just checking in, I saw that you just had a new grandbaby, congratulations, or I seen how was your trip to whatever, you have something in common to discuss outside of just, you know, who can you refer to me or I'm looking for more clients, you know, or that kind of business support, you can actually build a relationship with them beyond the business. And how well, you said you're systematic. So do you use a spreadsheet? Do you have like a contact manager type of system? Do you use Facebook? What do you do? So I, I use a spreadsheet as well as Trello. And Trello probably is my main project management situation. So I have a board in there that says networking. So anytime I meet somebody or get a card, they go in the you know column just met at networking and then I have each board has a system so like reached out you know received a letter to reach out connect with them on social media go and like and comment on a couple of their posts like I have a so each so they constantly are moving across the board the Trello board oh okay so it's time I've, to follow up with them and, and have another chat okay that's interesting so I have downloaded Trello but I don't really understand it so can you talk a little bit about how it helps you so Trello is, just imagine, it's just post notes, right? So say a board, a board is, think of it as a poster board maybe. And each list is post notes. So you could title the list, you know, met at a networking event and I can put Susie. And then the next one may say reached out within the 24 hours so that I will move you. The cards can be moved, which is like the post note, can be moved under each list as you go down my networking sequence. And it's, a, it's systematic in my mind, but it's not necessarily automated. It's me okay. intentionally sending you an email. It's me going to check what you're doing on social media. It's me going to connect with you on those platforms. It's me, it's me doing it that way. Okay, I get it. So I bet there's a, a bunch of different things you could use. There's a gazillion apps, but you found Trello really, really helpful for this. Yes, yes. And then if the uh, app I would say for scanning maybe business cards is like Cam Card. So you can scan Cam, so you can use Cam Card app and scan the business card and then share it to your Trello. So then you have their contact information <laughs> and then whatever system you prefer, you can move them down. You could totally automate the, hey, I met you at this networking event. I would love to chat through your um, customer relationship management software or your email marketing software, or you can do it manually as well. I just found it to be more effective when I did try to automate that initial contact more effective if I just send a personal email and not send it through my system. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, so I'm thinking right now about midlife women and even what you said about scanning business cards, I realized that I was really out of touch with that because I do think it's important to have a business card and I made sure my hubby meets a lot of people. So I'm like, oh, make sure you have a couple of my cards. And then I went a couple of months later, I'm like, do you need a couple more cards? He said, no, nobody takes them. They scan them. I'm like, oh. <laughs> I think I missed a decade or something. <laughs> That's so funny because I take them and scan them. So I take them in the moment and then when I come home or, you know, I scan them then. So I oh. do physically take the person's card and then I do scan it because then I, I personally take the card and scan it because if I meet somebody in person and I want to refer, I, I can hand the card to them instead of saying, do you have this app? Can I, like the tech uh, can get a little messy. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so funny. It's kind of like, you know, LinkedIn is, is, I guess it's really just a, um, 
like a living resume. And in the old days, we would, you know, it'd be all nervous about the final copy of our resume. And then we'd have to like pay a printer. We'd print a hundred of them and get them in a box. And, and uh, yeah, so things are a little bit different. And that's really, I think networking is different now too. So when I grew up, I didn't know anything about networking. And then I had jobs for almost 30 years. I still didn't really know much about networking. It wasn't Mm -hmm. until I realized I was unhappy in my last job and I thought I should start working on my LinkedIn, even though I don't know what I'm doing. So I started to build the beginning of a network there. Just every day I would just sit down, have a coffee, put a headset on and just go through the list of everybody I knew in the world (laughs) by like, Mm -hmm. where do I... Who did I meet when the kids were small? Who did I remember from my first job? What, who do I know that grew up in my hometown? I would just go through people like that and just every day try to add three to five new people in LinkedIn just to slowly mm-hmm. start building it. That's what I thought networking was. And then it wasn't until I got laid off. It was the year I turned 50 and I joined a, a direct sales company. So that was the first time I'd done anything like that, although I'd purchased plenty of Tupperware along the way. (laughs) (laughs) But I I decided uh, it was a nail product. I decided to join. And it was that experience that really showed me the importance of relationship building. I had never really had it, it, had it been really necessary to where I was. Like I'd been in these long-term jobs So then when I became a coach, it was the same thing. It's like, wow, you're an entrepreneur. You're trying to help people. You got to figure out how to meet more people and how to talk about what you're doing or you're not going to get anywhere. And I remember going to some classic networking events where you get 30 seconds at the beginning and you have to have your classic elevator pitch. And then it, you know, I got, I got better at that, but then Mm -hmm. I started to not really feel comfortable as to what to do next. So I heard people giving their pitches and I'm like, okay, there are two or three people here I should talk to. And then I did that. And then I just didn't really know what to do after I went home. (laughs) (laughs) I did not have the system that you are talking about. (laughs) So when do you start to talk about referrals and how you can help people? Do you find it's more uh, is it a formal part of your goal or is it just, I meet new people, I care about them, I know what they do, it's organic? No, it's intentional. It's part of the goal. So the calls that I've had when I've met with somebody in the, what I call connection chats is, you know, we get to know each other personal. So it's the basic questions. You know, who are you? Tell me about your background kind of thing. Tell me a little bit more about your business. And then it's always summed up, whether it's from me or the other individual, is how can I help you? what it is that I can do for you, who can I connect you to, or anything along that line. And even if you just say, how can I help you? Generally, they will say, you know, I'm looking for more clients and these are the type of clients. Now, I like to pre-qualify to a degree people for people. So I always say, are you, is your pricing, because that's biggest, the biggest thing, is your pricing, nothing against either one of these cars, but is your pricing more Mercury or more Mercedes? Because I don't want to send you a person that has a Mercury budget and you're offering Mercedes type service. So, you know, you just <laughs> ask that question, you know, or do you have a podcast? Or I'm looking to be interviewed on more podcasts. Do you have a Facebook live show? Like, it's those kind of things. Or I have an event coming up. I would love for you to be there. So generally the question, how can I help you? And then you fill in the blank according to what type of help you need. And generally there is an equal exchange in that moment. It may not be a referral always right away, but it may be, oh, I am looking for guests on my podcast. Oh, oh yeah, I am having an event. I would love for you to come out and support if you can. So sometimes it's, an instant way to support, whether it's following or, you know, checking out a blog post and making a comment. And then, then it's the long game as far as being, thinking about them and being top of mind when you are in a position to refer business to them based on what you had, had the conversation you had in that discussion. Okay. That makes such, so much sense. So I'm thinking one of the things you focus on in your business is this, this classification parallelpreneur. So can you describe uh, just a little bit more about what that is? Who is that person? Who's a parallelpreneur? So a parallelpreneur is a professional that is still working, but they're looking to be or have started, but they're in the very early stages of building a service-based business. 
So they can be a coach, consultant, strategist. They can be an interior decorator. They can be an organizer. They're building some type of service-based business on their own. So it's their name on the shingle. So it's not direct sales and it's not necessarily like a financial planner that works for Edward Jones or anything like that. It's somebody that's building the service-based thing on their own. And so they're doing it while they're working and they're not necessarily looking to leave their full-time position and become a full-time entrepreneur. They're just, they, they want to make sure that it's not a, just an expensive hobby and that it's a real business, and then they have a choice. I like to offer them the choice. Now, you can definitely leave your job if you build a business correctly, and it's an easy landing. Or it can just be the thing you do when you retire, or it can just be vacation money like Dubai. But you need to make sure you're making money if you're spending time in it. Yeah, that's so good. And, and I think networking is something that is so easy to do while you're working. It, you're kind of like laying the groundwork and building your business at the same time, and it doesn't, it doesn't, ha- it doesn't conflict at all with what you're doing. Right. Why do you think more people don't do it then? <laughs> Is it just fear? Great, great question. I think of lack of know-how, lack of I think just being shy. I just take my own self. I have been pretty much building my business online for many years. And I personally decided I was ready to get from behind the laptop because I like doing in-person events. And I said, I need to build my network locally, going back to having a goal and being intentional. So I just said, you know what, if that is my goal and that's my intention, look over the next two weeks and see how many networking events you can attend or what networking opportunities are available to you and show up. And was my 30 second shaky in the beginning? Absolutely. Did I have enough business cards? Not always, but by continuing to put myself out there, I learned. And the more I went and the more I said it and the more I practiced, the better I got at the 30 seconds, the better I got at, don't collect all the business cards, Neff. Who do you really need to be connected to? Do you really need the pet groomer if you don't have a pet? Like, who do you really need to be connected to? Right? Do you really need to know that person? So I really think just not knowing how to do it, just not comfortable. They think of it as a very pushy, aggressive, hustle and bustle, a lot of business card passing, a lot of shaking hands and, you know, very aggressive male domineering type environment, I think. And I feel like that's why it is a lot of women based networking groups to kind of take that edge off a little bit. (laughs) Yeah, I was in, I was in a uh, mixed one and two women ones. And I definitely, and I felt much more comfortable with the women only. I did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hate to admit it. Well, I don't know that I hate to admit it, but I did. I definitely noticed it. I mean, I met tons of nice people, but overall, I felt that there was more for me in the situations that were all women. Right. So how do you... Go ahead, sorry. No, no, no. Just to piggyback off what you said about the networking group. So in my experience, I am part of a women-only networking group, and I think it's just just a natural thing that women are very supportive and and encouraging and then I've had an opportunity to go to some mixed groups like you said and there was a definitely hustle and bustle very much different vibe I didn't necessarily dislike the vibe I just felt let me keep honing in my skills because I want to be in that environment I want to be part of that hustle and bustle and know how to navigate because I don't want to miss no business because I'm you know feeling like I can't hang with the big boys so <laughs> for me, so for me, I'm, you know, in a, a women supported group and I, I get the encouragement and the support to hone my skills, to get my 30 seconds, to get all the things I feel that I need to help me personal development wise so that as I continue to visit a more of a mixed crowd, more of a hustle and bustle, then I can get more comfortable. And then at some point I can join one of those and hang with the big dogs with no problem. <laughs> Yeah, that's so good about being intentional because my experience with it was I met a lot of nice people, men and women. I really enjoyed it more than I thought I would, but it got Mm -hmm. to the point where I wasn't getting any business from it after several years, and Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, is this the way I need to be spending my time intentionally? Mm -hmm. Is it that I'm in the wrong group? Uh, part of the problem was that the ones I found met very, very early in the morning. They started at 7 or 7.30. And mm-hmm. I, I just, for a variety of reasons, it, it wasn't working. So how do you assess 
where effective networking groups are in your community? Like, what are your, some, some tricks? Is there a way to tell? I think it's trial and error. Yeah. I think it's definitely you going in visiting. Most of them have an opportunity for you to visit up to three times and visit and see how the people that are members are their rapport and how they're maneuvering and do they make you feel welcome and have any of them followed up with you? You know, just, I would say definitely visit and definitely go where you feel comfortable unless, and I'm saying unless, because when I joined the networking group, I joined, they were having basically a meeting to discuss where they currently were as a group in the holes. And they were shocked that I joined because I got to hear all of what was currently going on. And, but I had an intention. My goal was to network locally and I was not going to allow what they had going on to deter what my goal was. And all groups have things that they need to talk about and to the need to help support and make better. So I didn't let that affect me, but they were definitely shocked that I joined because the meeting I attended was more of a discussion about how we can make the group better. Hmm, that's interesting. The other thing that comes to mind is, like I said at the beginning, how important it is to network even when it's not directly business related, like to meet, just to continue meeting people. Like I mentioned, some some women our age are, are deciding to move to different communities and some have blogs, but they they don't really, they're not really focused on making money. They're just really enjoying writing and they want to be with more writers. Other people are um, trying to connect with certain kinds of games or pastimes like golf Mm -hmm. or mahjong. I interviewed some women around playing mahjong and turns out there's a booming community there. But the point is to get used to talking and meeting new people as an older woman. And I really was surprised at how much um, discomfort there is in just trying new things, going someplace where you don't know anybody necessarily, and overall just being intentional. Like if you want to, if you move into a new community and you definitely want to meet some people walking dogs, then you, maybe you don't know anybody else who has that intention, but you do. So you have to get out there and figure it out. And you might not know anybody else when you go to the first meeting. What tips do you have for that kind of a situation where you have to do something on your own and you've never done that sort of thing before? I'm pausing because I don't necessarily have a tip because networking wasn't something that I had to do for any of my jobs, but I had made the decision that I wanted to build my local network because I wanted attendance from my local network to attend my events. So scared and all. I'm, I'm a God's girl. So I pray all the time. I lean on scriptures. You know, I say affirmations or I am statements back with scripture. And I went out and did it. And I prayed and I went for it and trusted God in, the, in, in doing so. And to, to what you said about people that's looking to d- dog walk, like I look at my window and you see when the people are walking their pets, then that's when the time you go out there, you're going to automatically have something in common because you're both walking a pet. Mm-hmm. So it ain't even about the business initially. It's just, hey, what kind of, you know, you talk about your animals or like you said about the games, find a local meetup that have that same type of hobby interest. So you meet new people based off the interest. And then as you learn more about each other, because regardless of where you go, I don't care if you're volunteering or at church, somebody's going to ask you, what do you do? And when they ask, then that gives you the opportunity without you leading with a business card. So my answer to that is, they just have to make a decision. This is what they want to do because it helps the overall goal because you can't necessarily depend on motivation or willpower. It's just like any diet. You have to make the decision. You want to live healthier. And once you make that decision, then you start doing what you need to do to make it happen. If you want to network and be more visible or meet more people that's like you, make the decision and go where those people are. And the conversation is about what you have in common. And it's going to naturally end up being what is it that you do. Yeah, you're right. And I think you, you really did put, the, put, put your finger on the pulse of that is that you need to be intentional. So if you're sitting there alone going, gee, I wish I had somebody to do this with, or I wish I knew more people, or I want to be more present in my community with my job, or I want to learn more about whatever it is, you have to do something about it. And I'm reflecting on one of the scarier things I did in the last couple of years. This is going to sound really wimpy. <laughs> 
<laughs> I doubt it. What you got? What you got? <laughs> oh, tap dancing. <laughs> oh my goodness. How was that? <laughs> I was scared. You know what part really scared me? It wasn't just going to the class because fortunately I did find a friend who wanted to go with me. But the part where I was completely uncomfortable, and this really surprised me, was going to the store to buy the, the tap shoes. Hmm. So this was really weird. So I, the last time I tap danced, I was 12 and 13 years old. It was a million mm -hmm. years ago. And when I turned 50, I decided to really think about some things that I enjoyed from my childhood and mm -hmm. consider bringing them back. And actually, I have a worksheet that I'll I'll post in the show notes about that because I'm a firm believer in really looking back on your life to moments of joy. And those joyful moments can give you clues as to what's, what you might enjoy still now. I really believe that what made you happy as a kid is going to continue to make you happy. Whether it's something you're going to do for a career isn't relevant. It may give you a clue, but it's just joyful. And who doesn't want more joy in their lives, right? So right. I guess what kind of happened, it's funny. I grew up with I'm one of five girls in my family. I'm the oldest, very female family. And I don't know what happened. I have three boys and a husband, and I'm the only girl in my family, right? So I've oh, kind wow. of been in this situation now for a very long time. Uh, and I don't know. It's kind of like I just was out of my element. So this particular store where you got the tap shoes was in a dance studio. So I had to go in a dance studio. I hadn't done anything like that in 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I had to sit down with dance moms and I had to try shoes on. And some of the dance mm -hmm. moms were dancers. It was kind of obvious just the way they moved and what they were showing their kids and the length mm -hmm. of their legs, <laughs> which is so funny because <laughs> I'm under five foot. So I really felt I really felt out of sorts. So I'm trying the tap shoes on. And then I felt so embarrassed to even just make some tap noises on the little floor there because of the dance moms and the little five, six-year-old girls who were beginning to dance. I couldn't wait to get out of there. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> it was the weirdest experience, but it really taught me something. First of all, I was, a proud that, I was proud of myself that I did it anyway because I was oddly uncomfortable. I did it anyway. And it's something right. that, that I've really enjoyed. I am a little afraid to fall because it's very slippery when you tap dance in a dance studio. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, mm. but it's been super fun. And I was very uh, aware of how thankful I was that I had a friend to go in to the first class with. Uh, I wish mm -hmm. that I hadn't been so hesitant, but I was very aware of it. And it's helped me talk to other women about it. And it's helped me with these coaching situations because as I said earlier in the call, it's super common for there to be hesitation and nervousness about, like you called it, shining, putting the spotlight mm -hmm. on you, going after what right. you want, going into uncomfortable new situations, doing what you want, talking about yourself, all those things. So I love how you say that, you know, you spend your, the first half of your life being a box checker, doing all the right things. And now it's time for you to kick the box and be and have and do everything that you wanted to do, no matter who approves, no matter what it is, but just to really put yourself out there. So if you could give a piece of advice to some women in the middle right now who have an idea in their head and know they should be talking to people and aren't, <laughs> what would it be? I definitely would say, Kick the box, of course. And just to think about the story you said, the thing that I jotted down was it wasn't even the fear of you failing with the tap dance. It was what the other people that may be in the tap store that was purchasing tap shoes as well would have thought about you, you know, being a woman in midlife in here buying tap shoes. And it was all about others. And I want right. you not to even think about the others. Yes. I'm saying don't think about them. I'm not saying they don't come up. It's going to come up, but don't let it prevent you from putting yourself out there. So just like you didn't let the fact that there were other dance moms and there were five and six-year-olds in there stop you, even though it was a little uncomfortable, even though you might have been concerned, well, what do they think about me being in here buying these tap shoes? But look what joy you've had to got to experience by not worrying about what others thought about you, even if it felt uncomfortable in the moment. Because have you did your first tap 
recital or skit or I don't know the terminology. <laughs> it's a recital, but it's a bunch of women, uh, older women. Nobody really cares about a recital. So <laughs> it's really but not. Like it brought you the joy that it brought at your childhood. So it was yes. worth being a little uncomfortable in the moment for the joy that you currently have. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there it is. That's your Neff Nugget. Do it anyway. <laughs> Kick the box. Kick the box. Kick That's the box it. and do it anyway. So now You're in charge can, of your own happiness. Exactly. And and it's it's your happiness being of service to others, which is the irony. When you're a parallelpreneur and you're specifically trying to do something with your business that is of service to other people, of course you need to get over yourself to start focusing on helping the people that are just waiting for you to get over yourself. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely absolutely come on Susie what's <laughs> taking you so long <laughs> all right so how can listeners get in touch how can they get more Neff Nuggets what are you offering out there so they can follow me on all social media platforms at Nefeteria Fonde and also the first Tuesday of every month at 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time I do a virtual networking event and so you can come out and it's an intimate environment. It's very supportive. Nobody's going to make you feel any kind of way if you're not clear on your 30 seconds. But you get an opportunity to do it in an environment that's very supporting and encouraging for you to get out there. So for those of you who are like, I'm really, really nervous about this, come and try it out. We'd love to have you. Oh, I didn't even know that you did that. That's so cool. <laughs> yes. And perfect for these weird times that we're in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Neff, thank you so much for coming on Women in the Middle today. Uh, it was really fun to talk about, you know, the importance of women just identifying with their new identity and their goals and being intentional and, you know, right. shining a little bit. Why not? What the heck? Right. Exactly. It's your time. It's our time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susie. Have a good one. All right. I told you those Neff nuggets were good. <laughs> I love the way Neff breaks it all down so that you can see both the importance of networking and also come to understand that it's really not that difficult, but you do have to be intentional about it. And I think that message came out loud and clear. It's about nurturing the relationships that you worked so hard to create. So you got to first be intentional about making relationships and meeting people, and then it's important to nurture them. All right, my focus as a midlife coach is to help you waste less time spinning and feeling stuck. It's time to get excited about your life again. Being the queen of your brain domain is the best way to be. Check out the show notes with more information and links at susierosenstein.com. Download my free ebook, Nine Secrets to Get Unstuck in Your 50s at susierosenstein.com forward slash nine secrets. Want to connect more with me in the future? Join the free Women in the Middle community Facebook group where we continue the podcast conversation. Head over to www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash women in the middle community. And if you're ready to finally put yourself first, you can become a first lady. Join my new midlife membership, The Finally First Club. This is an upbeat virtual community for midlife women just like you who want to stop feeling stuck and confused and finally start making the changes that you want in your next chapter. The clarity, courage, and connection that you're looking for is only one click away. Join us there now. We're waiting for you. Head over to www.iamfinallyfirst.com. Let's do this, ladies. It's time for you to put yourself first, one thought and one relationship at a time. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll talk to you next week.